Welcome back to our office hour on computational physics. Today we'll talk about an application, a very important application, thermodynamic magnetic simulations it's called. That's a lot. Okay? It's really not bad. It's really just trying to simulate a magnet, how a magnet works. Simple as that. Uh, this is a very important topic for two reasons. One, the physics itself is Nobel Prize quality. You know, this is a fundamental understanding of magnetism and phase transitions that occur in magnetic systems, which wasn't possible until one had a simple model like this. And it's a model which compu with computers now has been extended to very practical applications. The second reason this is really important is it introduces the metropolis algorithm. So this is an algorithm which was invented for another similar purpose, but now is just one of the most important algorithms ever written. And it's like magic. It works, and it takes some thought to see why. So we'll get to that. Okay, so let's get on. So what are we talking about? We're talking about the simulation of magnetic systems. Okay? And in particular, how do we explain the thermal behavior of ferromagnets? Whew, what does that all mean? Well, OK. Thermal behavior means temperature. You know, how do we explain that magnets behave a certain way when they get heated or when they get cooled? And what about ferromagnets? Well, there's all kinds of magnets if you want, or there's a few kinds of magnets. Ferromagnets are ones like iron, which is where the ferro comes from, one which behave like permanent magnets. So how do, what are magnets and how do they behave? Well, as we see here in, in, the, in the picture, ferromagnets are actually magnets in which the material, even without the presence of any magnetic fields, external magnetic fields that is, forms into domains. So these are little domains, and within each domain, all the spins for e all the atoms are aligned. So each atom has a spin, uh, an unpaired spin in this case, with these kinds of materials, and those spins are aligned with each other in little domains. Fine. And then the way you magnetize material is you don't change these spins themselves. They're always there. You know, these atoms always have spins, but you change the domains. So as you rub the magnet with, a, uh, on a, a, with another magnetized material or you put it in a strong magnetic field, what you do is you make the domains larger and larger. And so here you see small domains. You're making them larger, and you're aligning them in the process as well. So you end up with, this, when you get a strong enough magnetic field, or you rub it enough so all the domains flip over, and they stay that way, and you keep it cool enough, you end up with all the domains aligned. So then you get a very unusual behavior, and that's why ferromagnets are so unusual. You get what really is a quantum aspect, which is spin, which comes from the spin of an individual electron. You get a quantum aspect on a macroscopic scale. Okay. That's why they have such strength. So here you see an actual photograph of a ferromagnetic material, and you can see the domains. OK. So what happens? Well, the thermal behavior, the aspect we're talking about here, when we say thermal, arises because as we heat the material, as the temperature increases, the magnetism empirically seems to go down. And the question is, what happens? What causes the magnetism to go down? Is it, is it the domains moving? Is it the individual spins flipping? Well, we'll see. We don't know that. But what we do know empirically is that at some temperature, as the temperature is lowered, let's say, a phase transition occurs. Okay? So here, in this case, as you raise the temperature beyond this magic temperature, all magnetism disappears. So, this, so if you start off with a cold magnetic system, you just heat it at some temperature, the Curie temperature, the magnetism just suddenly disappears. And you need to see why that is with this model. Madame Curie figured it out. Now it's your turn. Okay? So we'll be able to explain more than usual with just this type of a simple model. So let's look at the next slide. So this next slide is interesting. This next slide is basically the icing model. Mr. Ising, Dr. Ising, Herr Professor Ising, invented this model. And it's a very simple model. It has n magnetic dipoles on a linear chain. What does that mean? It means that we have 
n atoms, n can be any number, large or small, and we have them on a line, okay, and then we have them, that's the linear, on a chain, and that means they're constrained, they're stuck, they're glued into place there, so they can't move about. So what we have is a constrained many-body quantum system. Okay? It's constrained because they can't move, also because it's in a line in one dimension, so they can't th move in many dimensions, and all that can happen is a spin can point up or it can point down. That's the only degree of freedom for this system, for each atom. Okay? And it's a quantum system. Why quantum? Well, because we'll treat this with quantum mechanics, not just, not just classical domains, but actual wave functions and try to build in the quantum mechanics. Okay? So what's interesting is we'll just do the one-dimensional model here. We'll leave it for the more industrious students there in their projects to look at this in two or three dimensions. You could do it in four as well. But there's no real difference in the model when you increase the number of dimensions. You just take an array which will be one-dimensional and convert it into a three-dimensional array to go all the way. So it's as simple as that. Uh, you have to do many more calculations, but that's just the computer working, not yours. Okay, so we have all the atoms fixed, so we have no degrees of freedom associated with that. And now we just have to talk about spin dynamics. Okay? So we'll talk about each particle i having its spin. So consequently, the wave function on the bottom here, or the state vector, either way, state vector is probably more proper, is just a, a direct product of this state vector, which is just the spin value for each individual atom. Okay? So each individual atom can have a spin which can be up or down, so it's plus or minus one half. Okay? So those are the spin values, and we have n atoms, so n possible spin values, which means that j, the number, j can be one or possibly two to the n in value where that's the number of state vectors we can have. And that's because each individual atom can be spin up or down, so you have two choices, and you have n atoms, okay, so it's two to the n possibilities, so we have two to the n state vectors for the system. So, let's explore the quantum mechanics. So, here's our icing model. We have over here, again, our basic system. These are the atoms. And now we say each spin can be up or down, so that's two to the n states. We'll, we'll take each atom, red, blue here, the color doesn't matter, as fixed. There's no exchange forces. You can't interchange the atoms. So you could say it's quantum, but we haven't built in the quantum statistics yet. That's true. You're welcome to do that. You know, it's always possible to extend these models, but it's always best to start off with as simple a model as possible and then look at all well, the results, the predictions of the simple model, then add in the complications and see which new features uh, are generated. But don't start off with a complicated model or you'll end up having enough trouble uh, debugging the simple model. You'll never get the complicated one debugged. Okay, so the energy for a system like this arises from two effects. Each spin can interact with each other. They can both be up or one can be down. So there's a spin-spin interaction. That's the dipole moment of each atom times the dipole dot product into the dipole moment of the other atom. So this could be up, you know, this could be down or whatever. That could be the spin. Likewise, each dipole moment interacts with the external magnetic field, B, that which is applied. Okay. So there's two possible interactions. So if you look over here, we say the potential then, interaction potential but there's no kinetic energy here, so this is the whole Hamiltonian, in fact. The interaction potential has a spin-spin interaction, which is a dipole-dipole interaction, with some constant J, and then it has a dipole interacting with the external magnetic field. Okay. J in this equation here is called the exchange energy. There it is in red, because it's important. Okay. And it, even though the particles don't exchange, that's the term for it. If J is greater than zero, then we have what's known as a ferromagnet. In other words, we have a system in which all the spins want to align with each other, like that. Okay? If you make, and that, that's obvious, because if J is greater than zero, then the lower energy state is when the spins are aligned, either all up, all down, whatever. So that's the lowest energy state, that's at J greater than zero. But if J is negative, in other words, you can take your code, just change the value of J, you have another kind of system, and a system which also occurs in nature, 
and that's known as an antiferromagnetic. And that's where you have spin up, spin down, spin up, spin down. They alternate with each other. Okay. So this is obviously not useful for producing big magnets to lift cars off the ground, but it is a system which occurs in nature. G, what's G here? Well, G here is the gyromagnetic ratio. Okay. It's actually the ratio, classically, of a magnetic moment to an angular momentum. So this is just proportionality constant, because here we have S, which is the spin. So that's the quantum spin. It's an angular momentum. If you want, we, call, we can call it a vector J of the particle. And then this is G, gives you the magnetic moment, the proportionality constant. The unit here is mu sub B, which are Bohr magnetons. So it's E h bar over 2 mc. So you don't have to care about all of this per se, but you know this is just given to you. This is the Hamiltonian. Spin, spin, spin magnetic field. So let's get on. How do we actually solve this problem? So look at the, look at the equations here. Now we physicists think we're pretty smart, and the mathematicians maybe even think they're smarter. But nevertheless, none of us can solve a many-body problem beyond two or three bodies. Two bodies is pretty easy because you can reduce two bodies to one, and we know how to solve the one-body problem. Three bodies are very hard. And in practice, only very restricted three-body problems have been solved, not even the most general one. And a few very restrictive four-body problems now are getting solutions. So. How do we solve the many-body problem? We don't know. We can't solve it. All we can do is approximate it. We have techniques. So we'll talk about approximate techniques. That's OK. Here, it matters. It's up to you. If you we can solve the icing model. You can simulate it on the computer with just any number of particles you want, two or three, four or five, six or seven. In practice, of course, if we want this to be a model of nature, we want there to be n and something like Avogadro's number atoms. Okay. But 2 to the n is a very large number. Even when n is just 20, which is not by any means atomic, you have more than a million possible spin state vectors. So that's hard to keep track of on the computer. So solving this problem exactly, or simulating it even when you get up to 20, would be a horrendous project. I don't know what the number is. People have probably tried to do it. But if you try to do 10 to the 23rd, forget it. You have better things to do with your life. Another interesting aspect of this problem is, for simplicity, especially in the textbook, here it is, you know, okay? In the textbook, when we go through this, we usually set b equal to 0 in our codes just to keep the equations looking simpler, okay? But if we set the magnetic field b equal to 0, you have no preferred direction in space. And then there's a paradox. Because we've said ferromagnetic materials are materials in which all the spins line up, either like this or like that. And yet, if there's no magnetic field, how do they know which direction is up and which is down? And the answer is obvious. They don't. Okay. So if you have no magnetic field, you have a system which is inherently unstable. If it's like this, you can suddenly have a bunch of them flip over. They all flip over like that, known as block waves. Okay. And you can see that in your simulations. So if you're doing a simulation, if you're trying to do a serious work, which we probably aren't doing here in this class yet, you might want the magnetic field to always exist, even if it's a small value, just to stabilize the system. Or you have to, if you turn off the magnetic field, be careful that the absolute direction doesn't matter, the spin. If, they, if you get this system or you get that system, they're the same, because there's no preferred direction. So we always must have if you average the average magnetism, m, for our system 0. If you don't have that, well, you shouldn't, you know, if, if it's aligned in one direction, uh, you'll, you'll get it if you try the simulation again another time. Okay? So beware. Spontaneous reversal means that the system can always just flip over. We have that. Okay? So here's our Hamiltonian. And, and because the numbers are relatively large here that we'll deal with, we'll use a statistical approach. And in particular, we'll use a metropolis algorithm, and we'll use thermodynamics. But be warned, uh, even though 
you'll see it in action. The mathematics we employ and the simulation will give us a very good model for a system in thermal equilibrium. But we'll start off with the system in arbitrary state and let it approach equilibrium. And this kind of a model is too simple to give you a solution or a realistic description of how a system approaches equilibrium. That's a much harder problem. It's a problem for which people have won Nobel Prizes just to try to figure out. It's a difficult problem. We don't have to uh, solve that here. We'd be happy just to look at the simulation of equilibrium and get some intuitive understanding. Okay. In particular, we'll see. Even the simpler model has a Curie temperature. That if you raise the temperature above some magic number, all magnetism disappears. Okay? So it's obviously a, con it's a consequence of this, the spin-spin interaction and the many-body problem. Okay? And as I said in the introduction, if we look at this system, any of these magnetic systems, for a temperature below the Curie temperature, we get a macroscopic, which means large, uh, quantum effect. And those are very unusual. They're very important. One thing that does not happen with our simple one-dimensional system is we don't get a true phase transition where everything just flips instantaneously uh, from one state to the other beyond the Curie temperature. In the two or three-dimensional models, we will get that. But we won't ask you to do that in here, at least on television, for your simulation. You can do that in the computer lab. OK, so let's get on with a little bit of this theory now. Look now at slide 31. So we've already mentioned thermodynamics, <clears throat> excuse me, and what we want to do, of course, is study the thermodynamic properties of these magnetic systems. Well, there's a, we have to model it in some way, and we start off with the theory. So the theory is called statistical mechanics. So this is the, the underlying mathematical theory of thermodynamics. Okay? So this starts with the basic forces between the atoms, the molecules, whatever the system is, and then predicts, using quantum principles, what the thermodynamic properties should be. So statistical mechanics is the real theory. So the basis of the statistical mechanics is that all configurations of a many-body system consistent with the constraints imposed are possible. You know, there's some which are more likely than others, but they're all, in principle, possible. And there's two ways of describing systems like this. One way is called the microcanonical ensemble. And that's an ensemble that's an approach in which you keep the energy of the system fixed. Okay? That's one approach. What we'll be using here is the canonical ensemble. And that's an approach in which you keep the temperature, the volume, and the number of particles fixed, but not the energy. So we let the energy fluctuate. It's as if there's a, a thermal bath out there that could uh, you know, exchange energy at will, and then you don't have to uh, keep energy conserved. So that's the canonical ensemble. That's the approach we're taking. So then we often speak of a system being a temperature T. What does that mean? <sighs> well, it means when a system is at temperature T that the average energy of the entire system is proportional to the temperature. So obviously, if the temperature is constant, then the average energy is constant. But the individual energy of the system at any point whatever that average is, has to be taken over, may not be constant. You can have fluctuations in the energy of the system. Okay? But the average will be proportional to temperature. And that's what we're so interested in. We're really interested in developing a model which describes how a system in equilibrium fluctuates thermally. Okay? So you see that you know, thermodynamics really is quite dynamical, even in an uh, equilibrium state. So it's these continual fluctuations, and we'll model them as random, in part because we know how to generate pseudo-random numbers, but also because it seems to be a random process. It seems to be a process which has so many variables involved, it appears random anyway. So the way you describe a canonical ensemble in statistical mechanics is via the Boltzmann distribution. So if we have a system with energy E sub alpha, where alpha, recall, was what we used to describe the wave function. So we have a system with a wave function alpha, some definite value, of one of millions and millions, and it varies via the Boltzmann distribution. So that says that the, 
the probability, capital P here, of finding the system in some energy state E sub alpha when it has temperature T is given by this Boltzmann factor. So we have an exponential minus the energy of that state, whatever the energy is, divided by a constant, the Boltzmann's constant, times the temperature. So E to the minus alpha over KBT, and then we have a normalization constant um, down below, and that's the partition function, which is the sum over exponential of all these Boltzmann type factors. But for our purposes, that's essentially a normalization constant. So what you see here is that this says as the energy of the system gets higher and higher, it becomes less and less likely to occur. Doesn't mean a high energy it cannot occur, it just means it's less likely. And that's the key. Okay? Fine. So let's let's apply that. There's another approach here, and in the textbook we talk about it, in which rather than summing over individual states, we sum over states with a weighting factor, a density of states factor it's called, uh, G of E, and that can be a, even a more efficient approach. But then you have to know what that sum, how you do the weighted sum. So we won't approach that here. Read about it in the textbook. So let's get on. Look, study, take home, memorize this next slide, slide number 40. Slide number 40 gives you the analytic solution to the icing model when the number of particles n becomes very large. We will not derive these here. It, it belongs in a course in statistical mechanics. And really, we give it to you. I'm not sure why we're giving it to you. We're giving it to you, I think, just so you have something to compare with. I mean, and you look at it, you can say, wow, somebody actually solved all those equations. Yes, and it was. you can look at the solution. So the solution indicates it was pretty hard to get there. So the average energy G, E, average of E, U, the internal energy of the system, which is average of all spin states at any one time, is given by an arctangent function. Okay? So it has exponentials, and it just involves the constants in our problem, the exchange energy J, Boltzmann's constant K, B, and T. And it, you know, it falls in one way, and we'll look at some graphs of this. And the magnetization has this co very complicated cinch function. So, solutions exist. That's for one dimension. Two dimension, people have also been able to solve analytically, but not three. Something left for you, but do it on a computer. And it has an even more complicated form like that. And you see here, though, interestingly, as we've said, in two dimensions, there's a critical temperature. Okay? In, in one dimension, it doesn't, there's not really a critical temperature. So, but you get two different you can see limits, high energy and low energy limit. Okay, so we'll come back to that. So now let's talk about the Metropolis algorithm. You know, I get, I'm getting tired. The Metropolis algorithm is the critical part of what you have to do. You've hear, heard me lecture at you now for a while. Why don't we take a break? Okay, and then come back in a few minutes. We'll look at this again. Okay, <clears throat> let's get on with this. So let's talk about the Metropolis algorithm. So this is one of the top 10 algorithms ever written. It's an algorithm which had a 50th birthday party just recently. It's just so important, and you can solve problems with this that has never been solved before. And well, I'll tell you the algorithm. It's not very hard to explain. It's not trivial, though, to understand. Okay? And it means you probably have to run the code, un you know, work around it, try it out, and then once you see it, you say, oh, yes, I see how it works. So let's talk about it. Okay? We're talking about a Boltzmann system. We have a Boltzmann factor. And that means that the system does not have to remain in the lowest energy state. So if we have a many-body system. We have a many-body system in thermal equilibrium or with an environment. And then we're wondering, what happens to the system? Okay? Well, the Boltzmann factor tells us that if the system grab some energy from the environment, from the heat bath it's in, then higher energies can occur, but they'll be less likely to find the system there than to find it at the equilibrium energy, equilibrium state, at a lower energy. You know, so the lowest energy you can have is where it's most likely. But you can't rule out the higher energies. They occur. They always should be there. And as long as the temperature is not zero, you'll get a full fluctuation. Only at absolute zero 
will the system fall down and be in its lowest energy state for every single atom. Okay. So the, the important aspect is that if you have finite temperatures, there'll always be some fluctuations. Delta E approximately Kb times temperature. So that amount of energy is what we'd expect the system to be fluctuating with, in some variance sense, uh, at equilibrium. Okay. So M Metropolis, Rosenbluth, Teller, and Teller, Mr. and Mrs., in studying neutron transport during the war uh, at Los Alamos, so you can figure out what they needed neutron transport for, figured out this algorithm, which turns out to be invaluable for thermal behavior. Okay? And it's a very clever way of improving Monte Carlo averages. What it does is it simulates thermal equilibrium and the fluctuations that occur, but it does it in such a way that it's very efficient, saves you, you know, lots and lots of times. And as it turns out, we'll just go about randomly changing spins and so that on the average we'll be following the Boltzmann distribution. We may not be doing it at every step exactly, but when we get to equilibrium, the system will end up with fluctuations that's Boltzmann-like. And as I said before, it's not the approach to equilibrium that this is so good at, it's, at, it's being at equilibrium. So just how you approach it doesn't matter as much. So the algorithm is therefore it's a combination of variance reduction. So if you remember when we spoke about random number generation and integration, uh, variance reduction was a way of reducing the fluctuations you could get so that you were always close to the answer you wanted, even if you have random aspects coming in. So that if you were just doing a random calculation, you, you don't even want to spend much time with the very unlikely probabilities. You want most of your random numbers to be very close to the most likely situation and weighted very few choices way out because you know they don't contribute much and calculating them uniformly would be a waste of time. And von Neumann rejection, which is our stone throwing episode in the pond, is a technique in which we throw a stone, we see what happens, we accept it or we reject it. So this is a combination of those two ideas. So here's the algorithm. Okay? So this slide, look at it yourself now, number 52. This has the Metropolis algorithm, and it's written down as essentially a flowchart. Essentially, it's an algorithm. Do this, do that, do the next, and it works. Study it. It's not trivial to understand, but it's rather trivial to implement. Okay. So, we will start with some fixed temperature. So the temperature is fixed. When we're all done and we have an answer, then you can repeat the answer for another temperature. Or you can repeat the answer for more particles. Or you just keep repeating it to take averages. But to think of the system, keep the temperature fixed. Okay. And for the fixed temperature, we start off with an arbitrary state of the system. So this is the state vector, and it's just an explicit uh, array containing all the spins of the n particles, okay, or a list if you want, but we'll make it an array. And for any value of alpha sub k, for any specific spin orientation, you can calculate the energy. It's just up, down, up, down, plus, minus, no big sweat. Okay? And what we'll find is this algorithm will generate multiple paths to equilibrium configuration. It doesn't have to be only one. And if the paths don't matter, it's getting to equilibrium that matters. Okay? So we will, on the average, just flip a random spin, which means randomly pick a particle in the chain, flip its spin, and calculate the new energy of the system. That's not hard. That new energy is called the trial energy. Then what do we do with that? Well, if the random spin flip leads to an energy that's lower than the energy the system had, that means the system tends to go downhill in energy, accept it. Okay? Always accept a lower energy state because it's lower energy, it's more probable, it should be there. But the unique part of this algorithm, it says, aha, but what if the energy, the trial energy, is greater than the energy of the system? Does the system go uphill? And the physics here is, yes. It can go uphill. You can't throw it out, but you have to accept it with a relative probability, which is proportional to this Boltzmann factor. 
and the Boltzmann factor is E, the change in energy divided by KBT. So the change in energy will be a positive number because it's going uphill, higher energy, so the final energy is greater than the initial, so this factor will be less than 1. So it's a decreased probability, but you still accept it. How do you accept it with an exponential probability? Well, you, we've done things like this before. Actually, just recently in fractals, we've accepted things with various probabilities. So we do the same thing. You choose a random number, r sub i, between 0 and 1, your usual random number generator. And then you make a decision. You set the new state vector, alpha of k plus 1, equal to the trial one if this Boltzmann factor, if the probability, is greater than r sub j. So you always accept it if of capital R is greater than uh, the random number, or you reject it. You keep the wave function the same if the Boltzmann factor is less than R sub j. And how can you remember this? Well, you can remember this if, if delta E was infinite. If you try to go to infinitely high state, then capital R would be 0. And if capital R is 0, you should accept nothing. So capital R is 0 would be this could, you'd never accept anything, as you see here, because 0 is never greater than the random number you choose. So this is the order. So you don't even have to memorize this. You just remember, you know the Boltzmann factor. That's where this comes from. So that's really the heart of the algorithm. All the rest is just bookkeeping and being patient. Okay. So we iterate. You just keep trying random spin flips. Sometimes you do 1, 2. Sometimes you can make them less than random. But just randomly flip a spin, accept or reject, and watch the system equilibrate. In other words, watch the system approach equilibrium. And for n particles, you have to wait at least n iterations, that's just a rule of thumb, n iterations for the system to begin to equilibrate. Okay? And then once the system equilibrates, once the average energy, the average magnetization, whatever you calculate, doesn't change much with time just seems to fluctuate about some average, then you can then you can calculate the magnetization and the energy. So calculate the you know the total energy of the system and watch it till it becomes stable within fluctuations. And that's equilibrated system. Then when we're, you're done with that, then you can change the temperature and see what the average energy or magnetization will be. And by changing the temperature you can generate a graph of, for example, the magnetization as a function of temperature. Okay, So, to repeat, to summarize this slide, which has everything we need on it, the critical part is we have a wave function. We just have the state vector of the system. Each spin is labeled plus or minus. And then we have a trial. We change one spin, and we calculate the new energy. And if the new energy is lower, we accept it. If the new energy is higher, we accept it with a probability, which means we accept it sometimes, we reject it other times. And that's it. We just keep repeating over and over again. So what kind of results do you get? Here, here actually is a graph of our results. This is a simple result. So this is time. In other words, you st we're starting off, and these are positions. So we're starting off here all black. Okay. So in this case, black is spin up. So we're starting off with a system which has all the spins aligned. And you know that's only going to be a good equilibrium state at zero temperature, which this is not. So then we start off with all the spin aligns, and we apply the Metropolis algorithm as we go in time, and we just wait. And what you see here is quite fascinating. You see, oh, little f areas developing here where all the spins have aligned in the opposite direction. What are those little areas called? domains. And then we end up over here with equilibrium, and the equilibrium state has a big domain here, a, a up, down, up, down, up, down, pretty much equal area up and equal area down, which is what you'd expect. There's no magnetic field. There should be e domains of equal size, number times size, up and down, and that's what we get. So we've explained already in this graph, amazing, uh, how domains get formed with the icing model. Very nice. So specifically, how do we do that? Well, you have two kinds of start. The, the start I just showed you here was called a cold start, 
where all the spins are aligned. A hot start is another start where you just choose the spins randomly, and you'd think that's closer to what you might want. Okay, Which one you choose shouldn't matter. In fact, you should choose both. And you should, regardless of what the initial conditions are, if you wait long enough, say more than 10 iterations, the answer you get shouldn't matter. Now you have to look at what answer you get, whether it's a magnetization or something like that, the average magnetization. But it should be independent of the initial conditions, because it's only the equilibrium that the al algorithm uh, works. The more, the more averages you take, the more situations you deal with and take averages, the better the statistics come, the better your answer looks. Okay, so waiting a long time never hurts you. It, it averages out some of the problems. The basic data structure here is just a one-dimensional array, the spin for the n particles. Okay? And that's all you have to keep track of as a function of time. You can either do a plus or a minus, or a, we did here a space and, and, a, and a black square, print it out to see how the system equilibrates. So very easy to print that on your screen, just like we have here. You can just see the system go. What about boundary conditions? We suggest periodic boundary conditions. So make the chain into a ring so that the first and the last interact with each other as well. And then it's like an infinite, simulates it, mocks up an infinitely long system. Okay. Then you have to start off with some parameters. And again, the rule of thumb is start off with something which will be slow enough so you can see it happening. Okay, you don't want too strong an interaction or too weak an interaction. So a good value would be J should be something like KBT equal to 1. So then the strength of the spin-spin interaction is roughly proportional to the strength of the thermal e equilibrium so that you'll see the effect of both hand in hand competing with each other. And start off with a number of particles, not 2 or 3, but about 20. Too large a number it takes you too long to see anything. Too small a number, and the fluctuations become harder, uh, bigger and bigger, and it's harder to know when it equilibrates. Watch for equilibration. What do you watch for? This is where you gain some intuition. Look at your printout and see where you get these kind of fluctuations that look with domains more or less the same size, or, or graph of the energy, the magnetization, which just fluctuates about some average. Then you know, aha, I've gotten there. As you increase the temperature, you should expect, you should obtain larger fluctuations. And likewise, if the number of particles is smaller, you should get larger fluctuations. When you get a large number of particles, the average fluctuation comes down. In other words, statistical mechanics, thermodynamics becomes a better and better approximation when the numbers are large. If the temperature is high, also, the energy of fluctuation is higher because KBT is higher. You get more instabilities of the system. Okay? So low temperatures, it's a much slower to equilibrate. Finally, as we've shown you here, you should get some domain formation, and the total energy of the system should be either greater than zero or less than zero, depending how you calculate the total energy. But uh, you know, if the total energy for this system here so the white spot, they'll all be aligned down. That's a positive number. They're all, all aligned up. It's also a positive number. So only on the interface here will you get any cancellation. So you should get a positive number for the energy. Okay. That bothers students sometimes, but I just explained it. So let's look at the next slide. The next slide shows you a whole bunch of things. And as you, recall, as you recall, maybe you recall, these little paradigms up on top, these little icons, rather, means in this case a Python code, and this is a, a listing of the code. So here's a, a code which does our one-dimensional simulation, and I'll run it here. And there you see our chain starting off, and you can see this, the spins flipping. And, as, and here you're seeing the total energy of the system being computed. And it's fluctuating largely because we started off with a cold start. They were all aligned. But then, you know, so it became zero at some point. But now we're seeing, even now we're seeing the energy fluctuating an average here. And now we had a block wave. We have it all flipping around. And it, you know, it's tending to align itself. We have a domain formed over here, another domain there. 
etc. And you know, we can rotate this system by grabbing it with the mouse, uh, but turning it over. But I'm not sure if that shows you anything more, but it's, it's pretty cool. Okay. And, and you can see the system here. This is sort of the energy, another energy. It's going from one to the other, as expected. But you can wait and watch this, but we don't have all day here. Okay. And the code is really quite simple. Uh, So there's the code uh, written here, and in, in, this is in double space. Okay? So most of it is just uh, the test here. Here you can say it's fl flipping a spin, find the energy of the test configuration, test with the Boltzmann factor. This is the Metropolis algorithm right there. Okay? So that's the whole you know, code. The rest of it is just set up. So pretty straightforward. What do the results look like? So what we see on this slide here are two graphs, and this graph is a complicated one because it has two items on it, and uh, heat capacity, energy, and magnetization. So the energy, what do we mean by the energy of the system? The energy of the system is just a sum of all spins of the spin-spin interaction. So here we have the sum over spin 1, spin 2, the sum over spin 2, spin 3. So it's a sum of all the pairs. And, you, and the numbers are n minus 1 because you don't count every one again. And you stop, you don't keep going around in circles. So it's the sum of all the energies of the spin spin interaction. And what you see on the graph here in blue, and notice the scale is on the right, that at very low temperatures, at zero temperature, all the spins are aligned. So you get a large negative number, minus 1. Okay? And that's just the scale set, the actual value doesn't matter. And then as the temperature goes up, it goes to zero. You know, it gradually increases and the, and the energy goes to zero because you get as many spins up as down. Okay, so the high temperature, the spins, this, uh, the energy goes to zero. Or some, yeah, goes to zero. Uh, at, or at least it goes to some constant here. Let's see, if is it exactly zero? Yep, it looks like zero. Okay, if we look at the magnetization, which is a simpler quantity. The magnetization is just the sum of all the spins. We don't care about the normalization. You see on the right that the magnetization, you start at zero temperature, all the spins are aligned, period. And then as you increase the temperature, they, it falls very drastically so that essentially at some finite temperature here, Kb equal to 1, as you'd expect, uh, Boltzmann constant 1, K the magnetization essentially vanishes. Okay, so that's what, as many spins up or down, the energy goes to zero, the magnetization vanishes. The heat capacity in red is a much more difficult numerically uh, quantity to calculate. Its thermodynamic definition is just the change in the total energy with temperature, just the derivative, one over n to make it intensive. But if you take that definition, it's very sensitive to these little fluctuations, these little bumps you have in the energy, because derivatives are sensitive to that, and you need a better definition. So in the textbook here, you know, go out and buy it, there is an example of a better definition, but a little more sophisticated, which we've used here as well. So this is the heat capacity in red, and what you see is that it starts off at zero, it has a peak, and then it, it fluctuates. And I think we show you in the book, but it's something you should be doing for your own exercise, that you can actually compare what you get from your simulation with those analytic results and see if the two agree. Okay? So I've said all that without thinking. And then we should go ahead now and take you into the laboratory and get to work. Because we have here a sophisticated code, simple but a sophisticated concept. And we have some statistical mechanics and thermodynamics, which you may understand, but you may understand better after you do this. And we need to put it together. So look at the simulation. See if you can understand somewhat better now what makes thermodynamic equilibrium so dynamic. Bye-bye.